drink for coffee. No problem. Is it all right? <coughs> that was the only free thing I ever got out of Harlan's. It was a mug. <laughs> Wouldn't be like them, eh? They used to do uh, open days, and I took my daughter down one day, and I says, oh, she was only a kid at the time. I says, oh, well, look, Harlan's is giving away stuff. A mug. <laughs> How many years of service you get a wee mug? My father, I think I give it to my sister, for his service, he got a medal, a silver medal with a wee chain on it. Oh. That was it. I suppose at the time whenever your father left, that was whenever, you know... The, he left in 1976. That was before, is it Olsen or Nielsen? Oh, way before them. Ah, uh, you know, oh, that was probably way a, bit, before a bit more community yeah, yeah. aspect of it when your father uh, left. Harlan's was always a family firm. Hmm. Always. There's a picture of my father, 1935, in the Iron Foundry of Harlem of Engine Works. He was only 23 at the time there. And could you just put a wee uh, finger below your father's chest by no much? It's him. Head and shoulders about above all the rest. He was a big lad. The shipbuilding industry has provided Belfast with a vital source of employment, income and identity since the mid-19th century. One corporation synonymous with the Belfast shipbuilding industry is Harland & Wolf, famous for the construction of the Titanic which tragically sank in its maiden voyage in April 1912, and the iconic Samson and Goliath cranes, some of the most visually striking and impressive features associated with Belfast today. The shipbuilding industry once employed much of the population of East Belfast. This area and its workers were deeply let down when Harland & Wolf released almost all of its workforce by 2003. One employee let go during this mass redundancy is Lawrence Godrath a once high-ranking worker with strong family ties to the company. My father started in 1928 and he retired in 1976. I myself, I joined 1962 as a message boy. I became an apprentice pattern maker in 1963. Uh, joined the drawing office in the plant in 1967 and then I eventually got paid off in 2003. I mean, it used to be, what, 78,000 people in there. And like I told you before, when I walked in there, it was 16,000. I walked out, there was 100. The whole of East Belfast depended on here, shorts, and the rope works up until, well, certainly the 80s. Belfast greatly benefited from the development of the shipbuilding industry, as Harland and Wolf asserted the city's place as a vital hub for industrial development. Well, they changed the landscape because they made a lot of money to begin with. They created a lot of jobs, thousands of jobs at the peak of the shipbuilding industry, maybe 60,000 jobs, and all the jobs that went alongside that, you know, the industries that provided materials, the services that, or that span off from shipbuilding. So, and they brought a lot of people here in terms of work. So they grew the city, it grew the city in terms of its population size. You know, the city um, was a relatively modest size in the early 1800s. It became a city of about 400,000 people by 1901. A lot of that was based on, on shipbuilding, the growth of shipbuilding. So, you know, it became a powerful, influential global city at, at that point in time. A lot of these jobs have been lost, whether it's, you know, the shipyards, the linen mills, um, you know, Belfast industrial sort of heritage. So these kind of jobs, which were very much kind of tied to particular communities, have disappeared. So the question is, what replaces these? No, there's nothing left. There's maybe, what, 100, 100 people employed in Harlands. If they want to do a job, they bring in welders from the likes of Poland or elsewhere. The story of deindustrialisation in cities like Belfast is a, is a very sad one. It has, it has massive economic impact on people. The, the loss in particular of skilled jobs and particularly uh, it's a gendered um, loss in the first instance for the, the male workers who, or males from that area in particular who might have anticipated entering those kind of skilled trades and well-paid trades that were associated with shipbuilding. So they disappear, they've disappeared. So you've got a reshaping of the labour market. Um, you know, a lot of what we would now call muck jobs and zero-hours contracts and, and different kinds of employment taking the place of long jobs, what were seen as jobs for life, security that people had. 
So it's destabilised community in that respect. It's destabilised people's maybe economic expectations in that respect. I haven't set foot in that yard since 2003. And I won't. There's nothing there for me. You see, the hotel as it is now was left to wreck and ruin. I was in that uh, before I left and all the the paintwork was flaking off and stairways were cut off and couldn't get into the offices and so on. It was a wreck. But it should have done, it should have been a museum, not a hotel. They knocked all the big cranes down. The tower cranes out of the Musgrave Yard, the Arrow Gantry where the uh, Titanic was built. That all came down. The slipways disappeared. I mean, we used to get people come from America. Can we go? and lay a wreath on the water. Well, this is, you know, commemorates maybe somebody or the family that lost. There's nothing there. It's only a bit of concrete. Yeah, I don't know anybody that works in Harlem Road now. All my friends are all retired. I myself am 76. I was a shop steward for about 30 years. I ended up as president of my union, MSF, which is a forerunner of Unite. And uh, when I got paid off, I applied for 300 jobs and only got one, one job offer, and that was in New Zealand. So I think it was slightly blacklisted for my trade union activities. The ordinary worker has never got control of the situation. It's the bosses and the owners of control. And if you don't like, what do you do if you don't like something? It's like the health workers today, they go on strike. Then it wasn't so easy because they didn't get strike pay then. Here today, Workers are getting strike pay against so much of their wages. Then workers didn't get to get anything at all. You get out the work, because you have no money to buy bread. Simple as that. Can you tell me if you're among the workers who are not receiving any pay today? Yes, we are. How do you feel about it? Well, there's not much we can do about it. If you go down through the streets of East Belfast, you'll see, and I'm sure you will know, you know, Titanic murals, and you'll see recognition of the Titanic, recognition of the other big ships that were built there, the great ships that were built there, and the the history of the shipyard and its contribution, for example, in the Second World War, particularly its contribution to the economy of the city. Um, but I think, you know, if you talk to people in East Belfast, they also feel that there's other aspects of their history which have not been addressed. Um, the history of, you know, of working class people, the history of working class life, the history of those communities, both nationalist and unionist. Ireland's was a a family firm. This is totally about the history. Other people are like me. Their fathers, their grandfathers, their aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters worked in the yard. But it was easy to get up. I liked Harlands. I didn't like what happened to it. I still like it. I was happy to get up in the morning and go. End of story. If I hadn't have been happy to go to Harland and Wolf, and I'd stop. Everybody has good workmates. I was lucky. My workmates that I had, I won. The ordinary workers. Some of the gappers, like I say, some of the managers I didn't like. But most of, most of the time, I, I was happy to go to Harlands.